you, Matthew, uh, Peter, everyone for coming. Um, so I'm going to go back in time for a little bit. Let's see if this works. The year is 1999. I was graduating from uh, with my PhD. That, that man was president. Um, and I had two questions that I wanted to think about. One was, what does it mean when we imagine what we read? And the other was, how can what we imagine possibly be beautiful? Now, the traditional role here, the traditional view here, especially post the 18th century, uh, whether it's from Addison, Burke, Adam Smith, the Kames, is that passionate, passionate and evaluative aesthetic responses, both what we feel and the judgments about the value of art that we make, involve an image-making capacity and an empathetic one. And the question that I was thinking about in 1999 was, since 1712, 1747, um, what, how is psychology, which was completely enwrapped in the philosophy of aesthetics, um, it was indistinguishable from natural philosophy and moral philosophy, what has psychology today begun to grapple, how has it begun to grapple with the imaginative capacities um, that art engages? And the first thing that I um, began to realize is that, you know, imagination is not a single cognitive capacity or a single faculty, to use the, the kind of enlightenment term. So on the one hand, image making itself is multisensory. It involves when you close your eyes and imagine something, very rarely is it something that only appears to you in one sensory dimension. Often if you imagine someone that you love, you, hear this, you can hear the sound of their voice as well as uh, see their faces. You can imagine a, a smell. Uh, when we dream, we tend to evoke all of the senses. And so this is just one bit of research that looks at auditory versus visual imagery and shows some of the base, the, the um, shared and, and different regions that are involved in them. But you see this is a really large part very, and varying parts of the brain that are brought together to create these kinds of images. And also when we think about auditory and visual images, they also tend to move, right? The static visual experience is not something that most of us have at all. Every visual image that we experience in life moves. Even if it's a painting on the wall, it moves with your breath as you focus on it. We just learn to stabilize it. So our uh, images that we create when we do it on our own or when we read uh, uh, and when we imagine, it's a large brain uh, set of brain regions that are distributed throughout and include um, regions that coordinate motor function. So not only is image making um, not just based on a single sense, but multiple senses and senses that are in motion, when it comes to the creation of narrative imagery, which is what many of us do when we imagine the future or the past, when we uh, engage with a, a story that we'd like to read, um, there are a range of brain regions that are also engaged in those kinds of activities. And the systems involve autobiographical memory and what's called theory of mind when you are imputing to other individuals mental content, um, uh, emotions, uh, desires, uh, Im impending actions. Um, and these ra ra range of brain regions are the ones that Matthew um, possesses, yet now he's going to know something about, um, which helped to make up the default mode network. So the Volvo Network was discovered in the early part of the uh, 2000s by uh, Marcus Rakel, uh, uh, Fox Snyder, a range of folks working at um, uh, Washington U in St. Louis, which were one of many resting states. So when the brain is at rest, it's not doing nothing. Uh, and the whole myth that you use only 10% of your brain is false. Uh, the brain is constantly active. And what that means is that there are certain things that uh, shut off in order for other activities to turn on. So that when you are focused on um, a, a, a visual or a motor task, for example, in general, the default mode network <laughs> tends to, to ramp down while you're ramping up your attention to the external world. And in general, the default mode network was understood as a primarily inner focused, thinking about thoughts and uh, uh, inner life and the inner lives of other people. And that there's some complications that we'll get to in a moment. But the point here on this slide is that it's not the only one of these resting state networks, but it tends to be um, in opposition and not active at the same time as 
executives for, uh, networks for things like executive control, which really has to do with attention, goal-directed behavior, and so on, or um, uh, various kinds of, of attentional networks. So the default mode network is what's a resting baseline for brain metabolism. And it was first discovered, as I said, uh, it's one of the first discoveries that came about through functional magnetic resonance imaging. Um, and it came when we realized, uh, we being the, the scholarly community, the research community, that there was no net difference between the energy consumption when you're doing a task and not. And so researchers tried to figure out what happens when the brain seemed to be at rest. And it's this set of interconnected regions, which I've listed there, that most of you um, don't uh, care about, and there's no reason to go into it. Um, but it's a, um, graphically, we're talking about one set of regions that go from the center rear of the brain here through to the front, and another that comes down over the, um, uh, into the temporal regions above the ears. As I said, it's generally anticorrelated with tasks, sensory motor networks, um, and attention networks. But what uh, my colleagues Ed uh, Vessel and Nava Rubin and I found that the default mode network has a particular role that is played in intense aesthetic experience. And this was kind of fun, and I'll run through this um, kind of quickly. So if the normal circumstance is that when the brain, when you have someone in an MRI and you ask them to do a task, these brain regions, uh, they ramp down, and as they're ramping down, the regions that are required in order to do the task become more active. So very, and it's even very simple tasks, like tapping your finger inside of um, a, a magnet, or if it is uh, asking someone to do a math problem, asking someone to uh, carry out some cognitive task. What we found in a, an experiment where we had about 109 images of paintings from museum collections, we asked people to imagine that they were helping a curator determine what should may stay in their collection. They could say, based on their own personal uh, response, how pro profoundly moving they found the image, and they could rank it from high to low on a scale of one to four. What we found was what we expected, that every time someone looked at an image and made a judgment about it, um, the default mode network ramped down, except in one case. And that's this, um, what we see in this slide. So here, let's turn this puppy on. Um, the blue shows decreases in activity. And so we have an image turning on, and someone says, yeah, I don't, I don't, don't really care much about that. You see this bright orange, which are increased, relative increases in activity in visual areas in the brain, which are in the back. And then along this front, back line that I just showed you in the default mode network, you see what you expect. The default mode network ramps down. Again, I kind of like the image. Default mode network ramps down. We see some increases here uh, just ahead of sensory motor cortex. Again, toward the rear of the brain. I like it a little bit more. We still see deactivation of the default mode network. But look at this. In the case where the image is deemed by the person seeing it that is as profoundly pleasing or powerfully moving, the default mode network turns back on. And that's a hard thing to make sense of. Why in the case where you're seeing something, right, visual activity is largely indistinguishable in all of these cases, but suddenly the stimulation of the visual, senses, uh, the visual um, sensory networks is not incompatible as it is in these cases with this default mode network activity, which it usually is. So it turns out that there's evidence that the default mode network is engaged with other arts besides uh, visual. So musical improvisation, literary reading and interpretation, story processing and creativity all seem to engage the default mode network. And this is very curious because what it suggests is that there's something about aesthetic experience that enables us to have a profound engagement with what is before our eyes or in our ears or in our head as we read, as coming from the page, and our own internal evaluations. So that somehow in those situations, there is no conflict between the exterior world and the interior world. And in profound aesthetic experience, those things begin to harmonize. So the next question that I started to ask was that seems pretty neat, right? There's a way in which not only is a visual image um, speaking to you, but you have heard the right way to hear it. 
So fast forward. This is work that we brought out in 2012. And I wasn't still in 1999. And wasn't only, it was only halfway in 2012. I was still stuck in 1712, which is when Addison publishes The Pleasures of the Imagination. So if there's something about these internal processes meeting with an external force, an externally focused um, brain, what does it mean to say we take pleasure in that? Because I could see that there might be all sorts of cases in which there might be this deep immersion in an external world and an internal once, but what might it mean to say that it's pleasurable? And this is where work that I've been um, doing more recently has begun to take me. And you know, sometimes we ask big questions and sometimes we ask simple-minded questions, and I'm a fan of both kinds, and this is a, a simple-minded question. Do we even know what pleasure is? Now, on the one hand, we have this um, uh, scholarly tradition where, and Burke will say that pleasure is a simple idea, meaning it's not deconstructible. Um, it is a pure um, uh, experience that has, is not reducible to anything else. For Spinoza, it's something like the feeling of life. Burke will say, even though it's a simple idea, it's positive or it could be positive or negative pleasure. Positive pleasure is something that you desire, and, or, and when you get it, you're very um, uh, uh, positively engaged. But then there's negative pleasure, which is what you feel when you a, a pain is taken away from you. Um, that's uh, also sweet. There might be varying qualities of ascetic pleasure, and of course Roland Barthes talks about this with the difference between. Um, uh, jouissance and plaisir, a kind of um, free pleasure in the case of jouissance and a more directed one in the, place, uh, in the case of plaisir. But all of these questions, um, it, it still seems that there's something we can th come think about modulations of pleasure, but it's hard to think about what exactly pleasure is and what exactly pleasure might do. I don't think there's an answer. I'm not saying there's a magic one from psychology. I'm just saying that this is a, an important um, question. So what is pleasure for from the perspective of cognitive and behavioral neuroscience? So primarily pleasure for most psychologists is part of our systems for motivation, um, directing us to what we need to achieve. And that there are two kinds of motivational systems, and this matches on very nicely to Burke, that there's one that goes towards um, uh, approach, encouraging you to try to attain something to get what you want. And then there's a motivational system around avoidance. Um, this is not exactly Burke's uh, pleasure that, or, or delight, which he calls it, which comes from the release of pain. But pain is, has, can, pleasure and pain can contribute both to the avoidance and, and pleasure and approach um, kinds of motivational systems. But psychologists also argue that motivation requires an error signal. Okay, which is to say that if you don't know how close you are, you can't get pleasure only when you attain something. Because there has to be something that tells you how close you are to getting it. Okay? Because that would be like, um, I, I'm talking to my children, and I just say, nope, you didn't get it. No, that's not right either, without giving them any direction. I would be a terrible parent, and I would never get any change in their behavior. You actually have to give direction along with the, the, the learning that you haven't attained what you desire. So pleasure has, on one hand, a kind of ramping up that you say, oh, I just missed it, right? And then when you finally hit it, then there comes an extra pleasure from uh, attaining. So you need an error signal that tells you how close you are to getting the pleasure or the punishment that comes along with, um, uh, with desire and motivation in the world. But what's interesting is that there are a series of, of psychologists who um, have been thinking since the 1990s uh, in positive psychology that argues pleasure is not just an error signal for giving us a kind of uh, dynamic negative. This is how close you get. But pleasure comes also and lets us know what's happening when we overshoot the mark. Right? So one way of thinking about this is to think about addiction. In addiction, you get the pleasure, continual pleasure, that comes with attaining the addictive substance, but you never get the signal to stop. Okay? And even when the pleasure is no longer satisfactory, you keep consuming the addictive substance. So there's something going wrong with the pleasure signal that you're getting that it's not telling you when you're sated. Okay? So some, in some way, 
pleasure also has to let us know when we've had enough. And that functions in two ways. So um, James Carver uses a different metaphor, which is one of you know, hitting the accelerator going up a hill. Okay. So you keep pressing your foot on the accelerator. You keep going to get to the top of the hill. But if you keep pressing that accelerator, you know, next thing you know, you're going to be off over the overpass in a ditch. So somehow, pleasure, the pleasure system has to tell you when you take your foot off and to coast. So the argument is that at some point, there's a kind of pleasure or a modulation of pleasure or something happens to pleasure that tells us when we can redirect our energy and our attention away from merely attaining the goal. The pleasure can persist, but to something else. And, and I'll use a, a, a metaphor um, just from the regular world of pleasure. I don't think this is an aesthetic metaphor, but it's a kind of savoring, right? And you think about this a wonderful meal, you enjoy it, you savor the pleasure, but you're not, unless you're engaging in some form of gluttony, you're not going to continue to eat. You'll enjoy the conversation around you. You relax and listen to the music. You allow that pleasure to open up your world. And Barbara, um, uh, uh, Car Barbara, God, bleh, Barbara Friedrichsen, there we go, brain uh, die, calls this the ability of pleasure to broaden and build. So if that's pleasure in the everyday circumstance, that it allows us to broaden our world and build our, our, our focus out from a, a particular narrow goal, the question is how much like everyday pleasure, which this theory was uh, meant to describe, is aesthetic pleasure. And again, the example of the great meal is one in which I would say I wouldn't necessarily, I would fight you on that one, call that a aesthetic pleasure in the same way that I think um, reading a good book is, though there's room for disagreement. I would still fight it. So the question is, how much like everyday pleasure is aesthetic pleasure? And there's some you know, evidence from uh, neuroscience. This again is from work that we did, uh, Nava and Ed and I, um, that shows that there are brain regions that are involved in reward systems that are common to all kinds of pleasures, where you move from this, this region is called the striatum, and it is involved in reward and, and, and pleasure. And we see the simple linear, largely linear signal that's like, eh, I don't like it all that much, up to what I really like. The same in another region in the brainstem, where we have this linear relation that would look very similar for um, an artistic pleasure as opposed to any kind of, of sensory pleasure. But then we move to this, the evidence that we already looked at a bit before, this is another representation of this distinct pop that is, differentiates the case of the most intense aesthetic responses from those that are, are um, mere, what I would call following Kant, just mere liking in the lower cases. Something happens when you get to the intense response that's categorically different. Now that gives us some evidence from brain, the brain, but there's other evidence that you can get from behavioral psychology that might help to think about what the pleasures of imagination are differently. And what we find out is that pleasure helps to identify classes of objects that ultimately can be, enable you to characterize poles of the artifactual and natural. And I'll show you what I mean by that in a second. So this slide brings together different uh, uh, studies, separate studies, of, I lost, this is supposed to be landscapes. That imagine, please, that that says landscapes. Sorry about that. So these are different classes of um, representations that were in separate studies. So a huge range of studies of human faces um, across cultures, and I just cited this one, which is a, a, a kind of review article of all of these, shows that between 0.8 and 0.9 percent of the, uh, 80 and 90 percent of the time, you get agreement about human facial attractiveness, okay? And that's across cultures. People will look at faces and make very quick judgments, which are agreement most of the time. And there's been more recent work by Lord uh, Germain, uh, who shows that when you take um, identical twins or fraternal twins, uh, and you try and see how much of their, uh, their assessment of human facial attractiveness is biological and how much of it might be cultural, you find that it's really, really a tail end that's cultural. It's way down here. So that the twins that have the same genetic agreement, um, they will be, they will defer 
and face, human facial attractiveness at about the same rate as the twins that had different genetic material. So the fraternal twins and the identical twins differ about the same amount on what they find beautiful in faces. So that it really is, in terms of individual experience, a tiny little bit out here that matters. When you move to landscapes, you see this radical drop off, okay? Um, and that's interesting in many ways. One is that we know uh, from, the, from our colleagues in art history that humans have, of course, adapted the landscape over centuries to meet our own ideas of what landscape beauty may be. But there still is, and you think about how we do landscaping, the ways in which we frame vistas, the ways in which paths are made so that we can come into the world in which we see, but there's still a relatively high agreement about what people find uh, beautiful, and I'll use that term advisedly, in landscapes. Abstract images, another huge drop off in agreement. But when it comes to paintings and poetry, a chacun son goût. Nobody agrees about anything, or they agree very little uh, of the time. Uh, and we had similar results with sonnets, uh, just slightly more agreement with sonnets um, than with haiku. And half of these haiku were translations from uh, uh, the Japanese by Robert Haas, and the other half were by Richard Wright. And there seemed to be no difference in terms of, of agreement on any of these poems. So essentially what we see is that artifacts of culture we have different pleasure characteristics. Artifacts of culture are distinguished by the fact that we disagree in the pleasure that we take in them. We may agree very much in what they say, in their semantic content, right? But we're gonna disagree about the pleasure. The faces, we're gonna agree about the pleasure. Landscapes, will largely agree about the pleasure, but when it's a human construct, we also see this with architecture. Architecture is about out here, just a little bit higher the, between paintings and abstract images. Um, but human culture is in some ways definable by the fact that we disagree about its pleasure, its pleasurability. I'm going to skip this slide for a second. Okay. So, what's special about responses to art? As I said, our pleasures in natural scenes aren't fully natural. Landscape is mediated by the art world in a variety of art forms. Um, but we disagree more about painted landscapes than our evaluations of real ones and painted faces than real faces. So the category of art and the genres within it in some ways register differences in how we take pleasure because, go back to this, that haiku and sonnets, I don't know if sonnets on here, have different pleasure characteristics. And we have an um, experiment we're about to get up where we take sestinas and chop them up to see if there's a length issue there or what, who knows. Okay, so if there's something distinctive about the, the ability of us, our ability to take pleasure from man-made objects, okay? What else is special about our responses to art? So we commonly speak of being immersed, or absorbed in powerful aesthetic experience, but there's this persistent cultural strand that describes aesthetic engagement as distraction. Um, and the finding that we have about the default mode network to a certain extent comes enables us to understand this tension because the co-activation of the sensory networks, the visual networks, and the default mode suggests that there's some mechanism of dual focus so that these internally generated processes that are often those that have to do with distraction, putting your mind on something else, mind wandering, thinking about your own thoughts, how did this have, you know, what is this like from the uh, what other thing that I saw before, but there's an unexpected match between external perceptions and the internal. I call it unexpected. Because if it were pr as predictable as our pleasures in nature, we would automatically know what it, we would agree on everything. But since it's not predictable what human beings will take pleasure in, it's a moment of unexpected contact between yourself and something outside of you. Okay. So the question is, what about art triggers this unusual pattern of engagement and this unusual neural pattern? And the answer is, I don't know. I've got some ideas. So part of it, I think it comes down to imagery, and there's evidence for the way that we evoke imagery across all of the arts. And imagery in of itself enables us to register the interaction of our experience of the world uh, outside of art and the world of art simultaneously in our body. And what I mean by this, you can think about this perhaps most clearly, and we'll look at a, a couple of poems in a moment, is that when you are focused on the page, if you are imagining what you see, it is because you are able to integrate 
that data of the words on the page with your own internal construction that you make in response to it. So that imagery, the very presence of imagery when we read, says that the external world has affected the internal world. Okay. Now, I'll take you through a little bit of what we found about differences in imagery, because I think it's interesting between haiku and, and sonnets here um, by genre. So this is um, work that I've been doing here with Amy Belfi, who's a postdoc in our, our lab, and, and Ed Vessel. And this is where we divided up. We, this was purely behavioral work, where we gave a set of, the set of haiku to uh, a bunch of individuals, and we were able to get uh, capture sliding ratings on a zero to, to one scale of how vivid the imagery was in response to the haiku. The valence of the imagery, was it positive or negative? There's a, one of the haiku, for example, is about a drunken girl vomiting in the bushes, um, which is really vivid, but power also really negative. Or there's one about a little boy stretching out five fingers, um, which is, to me, equally vivid, but much more positively valenced than the other one. Uh, and what we found is that the, the most powerful predictor of aesthetic response was how vivid the image was. So it could be a power, positive or negative image, but it was the vivid nature of it that was most important. So let's add to this sonnets. Turns out vivid imagery is more important to the pleasure that you take in sonnets than it is to haiku, which to me was somewhat surprising. I thought, I think of haiku more as a kind of snapshot of a single image, and that, that to me seems very much to drive the pleasure that I take in reading them. But it turned out, at least in the um, group of about 100, uh, 100 individuals that we had in, in both of these, that their vividity seemed much more important for sonnets. And you could see that either way, that if you're reading the whole sonnet and nothing strikes you vividly, that could be really negatively um, influencing your ability to take pleasure in the sonnet. But part of the idea is that there, these two different kinds of poems are different technologies we use to help us create imagery, and we rely on the technologies differently. We also find that it didn't really matter, um, this is somewhat hard to see, uh, sorry, how, what your native imagery abil ability was is measured by uh, this thing called the uh, a VVIQ, the Vividity of Visual Imagery Questionnaire. It shows that even for low imagers, people who normally don't take very high, uh, don't make very vivid imageries, it's a similar, very similar shape to with increasing vividity, you have increasing pleasure. So it's very close. Now here we see, um, in terms of, again, the agreement measure, people disagree a lot on haiku, but they disagree less on sonnets. I don't know why. But this is what I'm beginning to think. So if artifacts of human culture are distinguished from one another, in one genre even from another, by our ability to agree on the pleasure that we take in it, what does that tell us about, or might that tell us about artistic form? So what I've begun to think is that the pleasure that we take in imagination and engaging with a work of art points us toward the possibility of form. Okay, so let me unpack this for a minute. So John J. Gibson has an idea uh, called the theory of affordances, which is how that we engage in the world based on possibilities for interaction that are largely determined by the shape of the object that, in, that it comes to us. So you take a mug, there are only two general ways to take a mug, for the most part. You pick it up by the handle, or you pick it up by the bowl. Okay. So the tool affords you two general possibilities for doing it. There are other ways you could do it. You could be creative, you could stick your face in it, you know, whatever, but there are two general possibilities for it. It's not just the, the made world that gives us uh, or affords us possibilities for engagement, but the natural world does too. So you, um, a path enables the possibility of navigation, right? It affords navigation. He talks about the way in which a sharp drop affords the possibility of injury, and that's even encoded in the metaphor that we use to describe it, it's sharpness. And the idea when it comes to aesthetics for me is that when we encounter a work of art, 
there are things that are offered to us that we can either take pleasure from or not. And so what kinds of features are those that for which we might extract pleasure and which might we find displeasurable? And they are di very different kinds of affordances where everybody who has the same physical ability can understand how to navigate a room. Everyone with the same physical ability is not going to understand how to navigate a poem, okay? Or even how to take pleasure in the navigation of it. So. I'm going to switch to this one, which I think gives us a, a good example of this. So these are excerpts from Coleridge's Frost at Midnight. So this is a poem about, uh, there's uh, Coleridge, he's imagining himself uh, or describing himself in a dark room with water dripping from the frozen eaves while he sits with his slumbering child Hartley. And he looks at the beautiful child and he's sent off back into memory and he's transfixed by two things, um, the sound of the dripping of the eaves and the sound of his child's breath, okay? But the poem opens um, in the room with the owlet's cry, came loud, a hark, again loud as before, these two eruptive sounds. And that becomes the first rhythmic sound that appears in the poem. He goes back, for those of you who know the poem, he's sitting there, he's looking at the beautiful child, he has the, wet, the um, kind of flapping of these fingers of soot in the grate, and he's taken back into childhood when the, the soot from the coal fire, if it waved in a certain pattern, was supposed to say, oh, a stranger was going to come and visit you. That's the folklore. And looking at the flapping, he remembers being a child, looking at flapping when he was in school, and here we are. Already had I dreamt of my sweet birthplace and the old church tower whose bells the poor man's only music rang from morn to evening all the hot fair days so sweetly that they stirred and haunted me with a wild pleasure falling on mine ear most like articulate sounds of things to come. This is the kind of apex of the poem. The, the, we're moving towards the climax where this wild pleasure comes with this musical sound of the tolling of the bells, which I think here is really supposed to be a proxy for poetry, right? This articulate sound that's yet to come. Mm -hmm. he, <coughs> excuse me, he steps back from this and he's back in the room with his child. Dear babe that sleeps cradled by my side, whose gentle breathings heard in this deep calm fill up the interspersed vacancies and momentary pauses of thought. My babe so beautiful, it thrills my heart with tender gladness thus to look at thee. So we started off with the tonic owl cry, we moved to the tonic ringing of the bells, we go further to the gentle breathings that fill up the interspersed vacancies and momentary pauses of thought and all of these rhythmic events Certainly, this, the central ones are focused, linked on pleasure. And then the very last stanza of the poem is he gives a benediction to the child. Therefore, all seasons shall be sweet to thee, whether the summer clothe the general earth with greenness, or the red breast sit and sing betwixt the tufts of snow on the bare branch of mossy apple tree, while the nigh thatch smokes in the sun thaw whether the eavedrops fall heard only in the trances of the blast, or if the secret ministry of frost shall hang them up in silent icicles, quietly shining to the quiet moon. So here we have a similar but more intensified set of rhythmic occurrences beyond the rhythm that I hope you heard when I was reading. We have the movement of the earth and the larger rhythmical cycles that produce the seasons. Um, we have the uh, eavesdrops falling, heard only in trances of the blast, again like the gentle breathing and filling up the interspersed vacancies. Um, and then finally, the anaphora of these last lines, quietly shining to the quiet moon, where the representation of rhythmicness then it becomes more intensely focused in the formal features of the poem, which he's been training us to recognize by focusing on our attention on repetition and pleasurable repetition throughout the rest of the poem. So here, this is what I mean, which is that you have been trained to find pleasure 
in these moments of repetition, which then become overlaid with formal features. And I would say that the pleasure itself is what might enable us to identify them as intentionally formal features, as there for you to grasp in a certain way, similar to how one might grasp a cup or a paintbrush. Form offers multiple affordances for pleasure, I would argue, and not just those of pleasure. Um, because form can have semantic implications, it can have hermeneutic and interpretive implications, uh, but it rises out of the surface features of the objects, not in and of themselves, but because you're invited to recognize it in a certain way. Um, and it requires, I think, this pleasurable engagement of the imagination. But that also means, I think, that pleasure is important for form because you also can fail to find pleasure in it or not like it at all. Okay? And so these examples I'm going to ignore for a second and I'm going to go to something that perhaps we might all agree, disagree about uh, much more than the Coleridge, which I think we may be more likely to agree about. And that's going to be um, Eliot's The Wasteland. Since I'm not a classicist, I wasn't going to pretend to be a classicist and come up with some sort of classical artwork, so I picked an artwork that at least starts with an evocation from, from Latin and then Greek. Yay, best I could do. Okay. So the wasteland. Whenever I teach the wasteland, and I'm going to switch over in a second, hopefully this will, will work, um, the thing that I start with is the craziness of the echo in this poem. And it first starts off as literary allusions, and then there are these colloquial er eruptions, and then there's the rhetorical figure of uh, anaphora. Let's see if this goes. OK, so we start off, April is the cruelest month, breeding lilacs out of the dead land, mixing memory and desire. I wish I could do it in the T.S. Eliot voice, which is really annoying, stirring dull roots with spring rain. So this is lifted right out of Chaucer. Juan that April with his shot shot to the draught of March of passage to the Rada, and bared, um, and bathed every vine in swish the core of which virtue engendered is the floor. Okay. Stirring dull roots with deep rain. But a much darker and unpleasant version. But we start off in a world of literary illusion that's Chaucerian. Then we move into this world in which um, literary illusion is um, confused by linguistic echoing, where suddenly we have this the, the, the um, moment of the German coming in. And summer surprised us, coming over the Stahnburgesserie with a shower of rain. We stopped, we looked at the Hofgarten, and then we have this, this German line, which I won't read because you all would laugh. But we move from this particular echo. We continue to have um, uh, echoes and uh, literary illusions. So we move from that to echoes of Shakespeare, okay? So I'm gonna, if we forget, there's our echo of um, uh, uh, Baudelaire. But again and again, we go to the moment, let's see. Jug, jug, Keats. Twit, twit, jug, jug, the manipulation of the literary echo, the distortion of it, you're hearing the illusion, but you're hearing it wrong. Then we move from that to simple echoes of colloquial speech. And we've also had these moments where the, where's the pearl that was his eyes, these Shakespearean echoes, where really these are, um, what is that noise? What is that noise now? What is the wind doing? Nothing, again, nothing. You know nothing? Do you see nothing? Do you remember nothing? Are you alive or not? Those are pearls that were his eyes. Are you alive or not? Is there nothing in your head but, oh, that Shakespearean rag? So colloquial echoes set up in this repetitive form begin to disrupt the elusive nature of the poem. And they do it in a way that's both satirical and somewhat twisted. Okay? And it goes from that to the echo of the barman, hurry up, please, it's time, to the drunken slurring of the cockneys saying, good night, Bill, good night, Lou, good night, May, good night, ta-ta, good night, good night. Ophelia, good night, ladies, good night, sweet ladies, good night. These things become indistinguishable. But what happens at the end of the poem is what I find the most, and many of my students find the most disturbing, where echo becomes completely unreadable as something other than sound. The way ah, la, 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 um, or when it moves, for the audience which he initially had from the la la of the nothing here in this stanza 
to what the thunder said, where we go even from human utterance into just the echo of sound that's disrupting space. And then we end with the unfootnoted, now to all of us um, recognizable, but to next to none of his original readers, we have the sound of the thunder, da, 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 that is turned into Sanskrit that is as un 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 understandable to his audience as the, and uninterpretable as the sound of thunder itself might have been. So, back to here. Let's see if this works. So form as order emerges in this poem when the echo ceases to differentiate classes of sound, and the literary dissolves into the sound of thunder and languages just pile ceaselessly on each other. So we know that there's a pattern here, but we don't necessarily know what to do with it. And even as you grab hold the, at the right place, oh, okay, I see this repetition, I'm supposed to do something with it, the place that pleasure and form might have signaled in Coleridge are significant, you're as likely to grab the right way as you are to grab the wrong way. Okay. So the multiplicity of possible handholds, what am I supposed to do with this poem that alerts us that we might unlock the box, even if we never turn the, 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 the handles in the right order or get the puzzle done in the right sequence or at the right time. So form in this view signals the, poss the necessity of possibilities for error that are more than semantic or perceptual. And the error that matters for form is linked to the differences in the pleasure we take from an artwork and the ways we enact it in imagination. So I would argue that in this view, one of the things that cognitive science can teach us about aesthetic experience is that form and the mistake may go hand in hand and art and the mistake go hand in hand too. And thus I found something to embrace after all. That's pretty great.